We are honored to have Secretary of Labor Hilda Solis with us this morning. And uh, I just wanted to share that I had the opportunity to meet with her earlier this year, and it was through a connection from Diane Sines, who's a longtime SBN member and an SBN ambassador. And last night we were talking about sustainable prosperity for all, and Secretary Solis is definitely, without a doubt, a champion of sustainable prosperity for all. And when I met with her, I had always known that she was a champion of economic justice, that she had worked for decades to improve the lives of working families. She's been an advocate of protecting the environment for decades. But what really struck me and filled me with such hope after that meeting was how carefully she listened to what I had to say, how, how deeply concerned she was about the lives of work of individuals and families living in poverty, how deeply committed she was to improving the lives of working families, how humble she was, and how passionate she was about economic justice. She reminded me of all of you. So with that, um, I just want to thank her for the incredible work that she's done, not just as Secretary of Labor, but in all of the decades that she served in Congress. And uh, if you could join me in giving her a big warm welcome. She's the one that introduced us to Secretary Solis, and Diane Science is with Oceana, which is an international uh, conservation group. They're working to conserve and restore oceans worldwide. So, Diane, thank you for being here this morning. Thank you, Deb. Um, um, we're really grateful to have Secretary Solis here for a few hours, and um, um, delighted to here with the fellow native Californian. Um, uh, as Deb said, uh, she and I cajoled Secretary Solis to come uh, to this SBN gathering uh, to discuss how we can create more good jobs and economic justice together. Uh, this is a very crucial moment in time, as we all know. Um, Wall Street is doing just fine, but Main Street is struggling mightily. And um, just as, as a frame for this discussion, uh, we'd like to focus on the best solutions for job creation. Um, so uh, just a little background. Um, I'd like to share how we met. You know, I've been in Washington for about 30 years, but I've never met uh, Secretary Solis, a fellow Latina. And um, my CEO, asked me to uh, take his place at a reception at the Kennedy Center not too long ago. It was for a uh, NBC Universal screening of uh, a film on microenterprise, which I'm keenly interested in. So I said, sure, I'll go. So I was racing to get my work done and catch the last half an hour of this um, reception, um, which was being hosted by NBC Universal and Hillary Clinton. And um, sort of racing to get there in time, some of you know that I'm always waiting against time. And um, so I got to um, the reception area, and who do I run into but Michael Martin, one of my SBN buddies. I'm like, Michael, what are you doing here? You're from Minneapolis. Um, and um, as you may know, some of you may know him, he's the uh, CEO of Effect Partners, the top social change marketing company in Minnesota. And we're just catching up and um, Look each other's lives. I hadn't seen him for about a year. And um, out of the corner of my eye, my peripheral vision, I see Hilda, who's coming out of the reception that I'm supposed to be in. And, um, and I say, Michael, you've got to meet this woman. And he raises one eyebrow. He's, you know, predictably, he's, I can see him thinking, doesn't she remember that I'm a married man with two children? <laughs> um, um, and, you know, my mind is racing ahead and saying, okay, Michael Martin, he, his previous company was Music Matters. He represented Bruce Springsteen and Willie Nelson. I'm sure I can convince him to have Bruce and Willie appear with Hilda um, at some future event talking about the need to support 
poor working Americans that get more than that to work. So anyway, so he was a good sport, came along to the elevator. And for those of you who are wondering whether your elevator speech really matters, um, it really mattered in this case because I gave her my best 30-second elevator speech, um, as did Michael, and um, Hilda was really terrific. Um, you know, as Deb said, she listened very intently and um, said, uh, look, I need to get home to my husband, but here's my scheduler's contact information. Please do call and make an appointment. I would love to meet with you and talk about these issues in greater detail. Okay, fast forward two weeks, three weeks, and there I was in the secretary's office in a meeting with her and senior staff in a private meeting talking about green jobs and renewable energy. Um, and she met with Michael Martin, she met with the American Sustainable Business Council, she, she met with a, a number of affiliated, SBN affiliated groups. And to me, that was just an example of the fact that this administration really listens to good ideas from wherever they come from, um, but is keenly interested in engaging with us to solve the nation's most challenging problems. Um, so you all have her bio, I think, in, in your in your program guide, but uh, I'm just going to touch on the highlights. Um, Hilda Solis was the first Latina elected to the California State Senate in 1994, where she led a fight to increase the state's minimum wage to 5.75 an hour. In 1996, she authored 17 state laws to protect domestic violence victims in California. Former member of Congress um, from California from 2001 to 2009, she served constituents in East Los Angeles and San Gabriel Valley, uh, the 32nd Congressional District. She was also the first Latina recipient of the John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award for her tireless work uh, as a California state senator to pass the first California environmental justice law to protect mostly working poor and minority communities in California. She took great personal and political risk to push for the state senate bill, uh, defying the opposition of the California business community then California governor, um, and for help persuade then California Governor Gray Davis to sign this bill into law. Um, and uh, Senator Ted Kennedy and Caroline Kennedy presented that award in 2000. Um, she also authored the Green Jobs Act, which provided funding for green job training for veterans, displacement groups, disadvantaged individuals. She was nominated by President Obama in January 2009 as the first Latina cabinet member. Um, she's one of seven children of Nicaraguan and Mexican immigrants um, who, according to Wikipedia, met in citizenship class in California. Um, and both her parents helped organize workers um, in their respective workplaces through the Teamsters and the United Rubber Workers. So really impressive woman. And so, so if you could just briefly uh, describe the core mission of the Department of Labor and uh, all the sub agencies you direct or manage would be great. Well, first of all, uh, good morning and buenos dias to all of you. And it's really great to know that there are folks from California in the room. <laughs> but of course, it's good to be here with the Social Venture Network. I want to thank, uh, thank you for the invitation to come. And I apologize that it's taken me so long to get here. But like anything else, um, I'm down the street from some of you in Washington, D.C. But I think um, that philosophically, we are not far at all. There's not a whole lot that separates us from, I think, our agenda my agenda, but the administration's agenda, and trying to help further uh, the ideas that, that your group is pushing for, and those are better jobs, clean jobs, safe jobs, better communities, safer communities, and first and foremost, making sure that we can live in sustainable communities that protect and care for all of us. And those are very, I think, important principles. Uh, now that I am in the cabinet, my role has changed somewhat. And in the two and a half years, almost three years now, next year will be three years, 
Um, I find that there really is a whole lot that I continue to aspire and to push forward on. So whether it is to enhance job training right now, educational opportunities for people that need employment assistance. Uh, we're talking about 14 million people that are still currently unemployed and millions that have just given up and many more millions that are working part time. Uh, people that have uh, found that our economy is not working for them. And that is my role. Um, I don't create jobs. While well, everyone thinks the Department of Labor creates jobs, what I do is make investments. And I've been able to do some of that through the work of the administration. Uh, through the Recovery Act, um, you may have heard it uh, referred to as a Stimulus Act. Actually, it's still going on. We still have funding that we're still rolling out. But nevertheless, for um, our purposes, I was able to invest about $500 million that was given to the agency for the first time so that we could jumpstart the uh, Green Jobs uh, Initiative, and that was to help create jobs and get business and spur business and make those investments with partnerships at the community level so that we could begin to train people in the renewable energy sector. And it keeps growing. Certainly these things started long before my legislation was signed into law in 2007. By the way, that was under the Bush administration, but we were tarred. That was part of the compromise under the energy uh, legislation that was also uh, passed in that year. But the thing there was that the administration at that time, and that administration did not put any money in green jobs. So there we stood for about three years or, or so. So here comes, fast forward, uh, President Obama, and his whole initiative is, is to jumpstart our economy in a new way in a new 21st century revolution. So part of it was making these investments and making sure that we brought different communities together and that green jobs could be created for everyone. Not just for that segment of the society that was well off, that had the tools, that had the instruments, that had the funding available, but to make this clear across the country in rural America in impoverished America, in areas where vulnerable communities exist, where we have seen uh, unemployment rates upwards of 12, 15%. So I was able to leverage that funding to be able to make some major investment. And I'm happy to say that we're on target. In spite of what you're hearing, the rhetoric from others that don't even believe in green jobs or that there's climate change, hello. <laughs> I'm saying <clears throat> that we are making an investment because we see the other business communities making those investments and our competitors in other countries who are so far ahead of us in this game. I don't think I have to tell you that, but nevertheless, that's the reality. Um, we've already, uh, I, I think, have gone at least a third, if not more, of people that have gone through and gotten jobs in this industry. And while you may hear naysayers that nitpick and say that um, we're not doing enough, part of it is we have to spur business to make these investments as well. And making sure that our financial institutions understand that um, in some cases where we can leverage federal funding, not just my resources, but Department of Energy and Commerce and SBA, uh, we're going to do that. And we have been able to do that. And I'm happy to say that because of, we've been able to spur some of that, for example, the automobile industry, they're now, they're now uh, developing uh, lithium batteries, hybrid vehicles, Things that GM and Chrysler Ford and folks didn't want to do with for a long time. But now there seems to be an urgency to do that. So we're we're doing that, but on our end, we're helping to train people for those jobs. That's where our commitment comes in. The other thing that we do, the second most important thing with our agency is many people don't understand that we're actually the second largest enforcement agency next to DOJ, Department of Justice. I am I am clearly the one responsible for uh, the safety and enforcement of our labor laws for all workers who come into this country and work, regardless of where, what industry. If they're a farm worker, if they're a janitor, if they're a CEO, um, if they are a flight attendant, if they are a hotel worker, we have uh, every obligation to enforce our fair labor standards uh, rules and our regulations and our laws. So minimum wage, overtime. We also get involved in other issues that might be of concern to you regulations with respect to OSHA that we enforce to protect workers from, uh, say, serious or egregious contaminants or workplace safety issues like the mining industry, 
coal industry, areas like that, where we have to also play a role and make sure that we have um, compliance by businesses. And there are many people, and I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone here, but there's some on the other side of the aisle that think that any regulation is bad. It's bad for our economy. And I can tell you that we saved a lot of lives. We also helped keep a lot of people at work because we asked and, and enforced our laws to say that if you're in this, in this business to make money, then you must abide by our rules. And it's unfair to cheat workers out of their salaries and their pay and their overtime, what they are due, but also it's not good business to cheat other businesses as well by somehow forcing people to do things that are against the law, that are illegal, quite frankly. It's bad competition. And then there's a whole source of uh, funding that goes in that underground, that black market or underground economy, that we're not able to capture those funds that would help to go in to repair our bridges, our public education systems, our different systems that help to maintain social safety nets for so many people. If we were to capture that money, that would go a long way, I think, in helping all of our communities right now. So that's another source of where I'm paying particular attention right now.